There are three types of cartilage that we're going to look at. And the first one is hyaline cartilage. And this is one that we have, we have a lot of hyaline cartilage. Uh, it lines our movable joints because hyaline cartilage is ground substance is very smooth. It's made of hyaluronic acid. And it has, it's very, very smooth, has a very low coefficient of friction, which means that two, uh, two pieces of hyaline cartilage rubbing up against each other does not cause a lot of friction. It's very smooth. And, and when it gets lined with, with an oily fluid that we have in our joints called synovial fluid, it makes it very, very slick, like trying to walk on oily glass. So what we notice with cartilage is that the ground substance is fairly dense and in cartilage it's usually somewhat flexible, a little bit pliable, but very, very sturdy. And this, these cells that you find inside cartilage are called chondroblasts, which, which eventually become chondrocytes. Chondroblasts secrete the ground substance that makes up the matrix of the cartilage. Eventually that ground substance hardens into what we see and the cell gets trapped in a little space inside that ground substance. That space is called a lacuna. So these little spaces here are called lacuna. And inside the lacuna is a chondrocyte. Once the chondroblast matures and is trapped inside its own lacuna, it's called a chondrocyte. Chondro means cartilage. So what you see in this image are chondrocytes surrounded by a lacuna trapped in the ground substance of the hyaline cartilage. The next one is elastic cartilage. The elastic cartilage makes up the shape of your ear. Elastic cartilage has a lot of elastic fibers in it, also a lot of chondrocytes inside lacuna. Con elastic cartilage is good for parts of our body that need to resist some stresses but need to maintain their shape, like your ear. If you bend your ear down, it'll snap back to its original shape because it has elastic cartilage in it. Fibrocartilage has a lot of fibers. You can see a lot of collagen fibers amidst all of the cells inside lacuna. There's chondrocyte in lacuna, there's a chondrocyte in lacuna, etc. You can see them here as well. Lots of collagen fibers because these areas where you find fibrocartilage need to resist a lot of forces as well. Fibrocartilage makes up the intervertebral discs in between your vertebrae so that they serve as a good shock absorber and also gives your spine some flexibility for movement. Fibrocartilage has a low blood supply but is very strong and sturdy. The next type of connective tissue is bone. Bone has a matrix of what's called hydroxyapatite, which is a combination of calcium and phosphorus. And what happens is a blood vessel in here allows for osteocytes to begin to secrete that matrix in concentric circles around itself. And you ultimately end up with what's called concentric lamellae, layers of bone matrix that are surrounding what's called a central canal. And that makes up a very, very thick, dense tissue of bone. And the last one is blood. Blood is connective tissue. Blood consists of red blood cells as well as white blood cells. There's many different types of white blood cells. And I would like to take a little bit of time to break down red blood cells versus white blood cells as a component of blood. We'll start with the white blood cells. I would like to take a little bit of time to break down red blood cells versus white blood cells as a component of blood. We'll start with the white blood cells. Blood is a connective tissue that helps to support. It helps to carry a lot of gases and blood carries hormones and glucose and all, their, all, all things that we need to move around our body, blood can take. And blood the cells of blood are red blood cells and white blood cells, and it is connective tissue. When you look at the difference between red and white blood cells, what you're going to notice is the red blood cells, which are round and biconcave, meaning that they are depressed on both ends, 
are anuclear. They don't have a nucleus. They're also a lot smaller than the white blood cells. White blood cells have a nucleus. Some of them have a multi-lobed nucleus, like a neutrophil, also called a polymorphonucleated cell. Some of them have a dual-lobed, like a horseshoe-shaped, like a young neutrophil, before it really becomes in that mature, multi-lobed shape. Some of them have a single nucleus that's about half the size of the cytoplasm, like a lymphocyte. And some of them have a large nucleus that's more than half the size of the cytoplasm, like a monocyte. Another big thing you're going to see with, new, with white blood cells is that some of them have granules in the cytoplasm. And some of them do not. The white blood cells that have granules are called granulocytes, and they include neutrophils, basophils, and eosinophils. There's a basophil, there's an eosinophil, and there's a neutrophil. The agranulocytes that do not have granules are monocytes and lymphocytes. White blood cells have a lot to do with the immune response, with the inflammatory response. There's a lot to go into with white blood cells, and, and, and uh, their functions are better understood when you are doing blood as its own unit. Red blood cells are associated with carrying oxygen, uh, making sure oxygen can be brought to the cells from the lungs. In between the cells is blood plasma. So just like other connective tissue, blood is really cells and matrix. The matrix of blood is the blood plasma, which is mostly water. The cells are red blood cells, white blood cells, and these small fragments called platelets. I think blood is better investigated in its own unit, so we're going to really cut blood short a little bit in this histology and connective tissue overview. So that's about it for the connective tissue video tutorial. I hope that you guys have gotten a lot out of it and continue to check the YouTube channel for more videos to help you with A&P. Good luck.